Everybody, happy Wednesday and welcome back to the stream on whatever channel you guys are watching on right now. It is a very fun Wednesday here with my puppy living the dream and ready to talk about a very controversial subject that a ton of you guys have been asking us to weigh in on on <clears throat> excuse me <coughs> on the stream today. Wow, I'm dying. My fiance got me up this morning. At 530 in the morning because we did a 6 a.m. combo high intensity interval training hit yoga class and now I am exhausted but I actually am pretty happy. I feel good about myself getting up this morning getting to the gym. I have no idea what day or time it is because I've taken two red eye flights from the west coast to the east coast in the last week so my brain and circadian rhythm is a bit off but more than anything I'm very glad to be back home to be in the home studio and to be hanging out with all of you guys today it is also my sister Gabby's birthday she's 24 years old today so please join me in welcoming Gabby to the year 24 and wishing her the best birthday ever I wish I could be with her today but she is in medical school in Ohio. I'm down here in Florida. So sadly, we are a long ways apart these days. It's weird when you grow up and like you spend all of your time with your siblings 100% of the time and you kind of want nothing else than to get away and have your own life experience. And then you all grow up and it's really sad because you wish more than anything that you could still live under the same roof as your siblings and you can't anymore. You can never go back. So if on the off chance you guys are still at home and you're with your siblings, take all of that 
not for granted, but in stride with blessings every single day that you can spend some extra time with the people that are closest to you in your life. Love my sisters so very much and hope she has the best birthday ever. All right, you guys, this Wednesday stream, I promised that we were eventually going to be weighing in on this, but I was hoping for a little bit more information to come out. I feel like we've waited a good amount of time for the whole picture to be painted on what the heck is going on. But as requested by very, very many of you, we are covering the Alabama State Supreme Court decision on in vitro fertilization, IVF. It is incredibly controversial and frankly, very, very complex. And I, for one, have been really confused about the amount of misinformation and straight up propaganda surrounding all kinds of aspects of this argument that are out there about what happened in Alabama just a few days ago. So we're going to be answering all of your questions today, covering every single thing that you need to know about the Alabama State Supreme Court ruling on IVF talking about why IVF as a practice is so controversial and why people have such very, very deeply passionate opinions about it. Um, I'll weigh in a little bit with my point of view, but be to be totally honest with you, this is just such a complex issue. And I hope that you guys will also continue weighing in because it's important for all of us to get every single point of view on this discussion as possible. So as we're jumping in and wanting to have as many people participating in the conversation as we can, please do us a favor. What do you want to tell them? smash that follow or subscribe button so you always know when we're going live and hit the like button if you haven't already on this stream that could look like a thumbs up or a heart depending on where you're watching and we're so glad that you guys are here let's say hi to a few people before we jump into all of the nitty-gritty of this subject over on instagram we've got joey watching isabel the gem thank you so so very much and paino says you killed it on laura's show last night you guys might have seen i was on fox news last night with laura ingram quite a fun conversation with my awesome fan friend uh xavier the absolute legend all of you trolls asking if i have an only fans no i do not i never will this is where you can find me on Instagram and everywhere else. Over on Locals, we've got Sabina, Alex, Emrock, and Nitty Witty kicking things off for us in the chat. John Best and Mike Quillwin are over on Rumble and many, many others. Tons of people in our YouTube chat today. We love to see it. Naruto, Amy is here. We've got Total Package, Rob Hellfire, Daloon, Lowride, and more. You guys are the goats, and I'm so glad you are a part of this great conversation. Some of you guys are saying uh, that you never have heard anything about what's going on with the Alabama Supreme Court ruling. So this is good. This will be really helpful for you to wrap your head around everything that's going on. But basically to just kick things off and give you the 30,000 foot overview to everything that is going on this week. There was a very, very controversial decision in the Alabama judicial system in their state Supreme Court that came out a few days ago and has everybody in media and politics kind of losing their minds. First and foremost, it's about a controversial subject and practice in and of itself, and that is IVF or in vitro fertilization. If you need me to zoom out even further from that of what is IVF, IVF is when a child is conceived outside of your uterus, outside of the human body, and actually is conceived in a laboratory artificially and then implanted into a woman's womb with the hope that she will eventually implant uh, that pregnancy into her uterine wall and carry that baby to term. It's been a practice scientifically for about 50 years, and there's already been a lot of controversy, especially in the last several years surrounding IVF on whether or not it's an ethical practice, particularly with babies that are created and not used for implantation. If there's questions about eugenics and genetic testing, that's been really controversial over the last few years. But this all kind of came to a head a few days ago in the state of Alabama because of an ongoing case of litigation with families that were involved with IDF, IVF, excuse me, were using IVF to try to conceive a child. And something happened at the hospital that ended up destroying some of their embryos, essentially killing their children. And they want to seek punitive damages for this. So contrary to what you might be hearing in the media or on social media or from people just getting really angry in political speeches, of which there has been a lot of noise, basically what happened is several families, three different families, who were trying to use IVF to have a child ended up having some embryos destroyed really tragically. We'll get into all of the nitty gritty of the case itself and want to seek punitive damages against the person that destroyed those embryos, claiming that that killed their children, that that was the wrongful death 
of a minor, which already is an existing statute in Alabama. The wrongful death of a minor law has already been preconceived law. It's already very well established. And they're trying to use this statute to seek punitive damages for the destruction of their embryos, which previously under American law have never been under question for legal personhood. And I think that's a really important place for us to start because even though we have equal protection under law in America, even though if you commit a homicide against a pregnant woman and you can be charged for a double homicide, so we've acknowledged that there is personhood in the womb for an unborn child, there has never been a legal question up until now if an embryo that is outside of a woman's body, that is outside of the womb, constitutes a legal person, more than just a biological person, does this constitute a legal person? So this is kind of an unprecedented legal question to have been asked in the United States of America up to this point. Long story short, and again, we'll get it all, into all the semantics, but just to give you the overview first, the Alabama State Supreme Court said, yes, an embryo is a genetically unique human being that has never existed before, will never exist again. Because it is biologically a human being, legally it is also a human being, and these families whose embryos were wrongfully destroyed have the legal right to seek punitive damages in the destruction of their embryos. That's it. That was the only legal question in front of the Alabama Supreme Court. No one has attempted to ban IVF legally as a practice through this. This is not ongoing legislation or a bill being presented in the state of Alabama. This is not a national cause for concern over a national ban on in vitro fertilization. They were asking a question legally, is an embryo considered a legal child? And if so, can this family sue the people who destroyed the embryos to try to seek punitive damages? That's it. So I've seen a lot of meltdowns on the internet in the last several years. Or not years. Wow. Isabel needs a nap. 6 a.m. yoga is not a good, not a good situation. I've seen a lot of people having meltdowns on the internet over the past several days because they're saying, well, Alabama is trying to ban this practice of IVF. No doctor is ever going to work in Alabama again. All of these patients are having their procedures canceled because of these horrible politicians. No politician has initiated a law to ban IVF. This isn't even legislation. This was a court case asking about the legal personhood status of children in the state of Alabama. And there are now hospitals trying to renege their IVF practices and get rid of them and cancel appointments simply because they are afraid of punitive damages and they're afraid of being sued. They're basically afraid of being criminally liable or civilly liable for if something went wrong uh, in an IVF situation in the state of Alabama. But that doesn't mean the state is trying to make it illegal. That certainly doesn't mean uh, that there are politicians trying to ban this practice in America, at least not today. But it's opened up this entire massive can of worms of whether or not IVF should be legal or should be banned and the ethical concerns surrounding this process and this particular scientific advancement. So that's just the overview of what's been going on in the last several days. Johns Hopkins School of Public Health did a fascinating overview podcast about this. And there's a few different snippets that I want us to react to because they're trying to just explain what the heck is going on before everybody starts freaking out. Before we jump into that, I do just want to say if IVF has been a part of your life or you were conceived through IVF, you matter, you are worthy, you are valuable, your life has inherent dignity because it doesn't matter the circumstances of your conception. Once you are a human being, you are a human being. And as somebody who considers herself unapologetically pro-life from womb to tomb and even outside of the womb, if you were conceived through IVF, I 100% am glad that you are here and support your right to exist and your right to life. But even I am really struggling with a lot of the ethical questions surrounding this practice moving forward. And I think it's all something that we as humanity should be asking as we do with every other bioethical question that we ask on my stream and all of my content and at large in the scientific community just because we can do something, should we do something? And I'm not necessarily here to answer that question today, but I am here to invite you to you have you ask these questions in your own life alongside of me and at least get the conversation going because I think it's an important one for us to be having as technological advances continue to change the definition of pregnancy, of parenthood, of families at large, and just human advancement in society 
period. So if you agree with something that I say, if you disagree with something that I say during the stream today, that is totally welcome. I'm very glad you are here. And this is a really nuanced and complicated conversation that obviously involves a lot of emotions and passion along the way. I just want you guys to participate, even if you disagree. So make sure you're using the chat throughout our entire conversation today. Let's talk more specifically really quick about this sp Supreme Court ruling, this particular legal case in the state of Alabama, because again, contrary to what you may have heard, this is not a bill to ban IVF. IVF is not illegal in the state of Alabama today. And this was really a legal question about protected status of personhood under Alabama state law. So the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, the Bloomberg School, uh, put together a really interesting overview on what the heck was going on. They did a podcast interview about this um, for their public health on call podcast, but put together a little bit of a synopsis. And I think it's going to be really helpful for us to check out. So on February 16th was when this Alabama state Supreme Court ruling happened. And basically the ruling declares that an embryo created through IVF, again, in a lab, not naturally conceived as an embryo, but if you put an egg cell and you put a sperm cell together in a laboratory and create an embryo before implanting it into a womb, that is still a person and under Alabama state law is legally considered a child. So because of all of that, because they're afraid of being sued, they're afraid of criminal and civil liability, IVF clinics throughout the state of Alabama, including one of the biggest ones in the state at the University of Alabama Birmingham Hospital, have now paused IVF practices. But it's not because it's illegal. It's because basically they are afraid of getting sued. Interesting. What happened here was that there were three couples, three families, all of whom were IVF patients. So they are not seeking to make IVF illegal but they were all going undergoing IVF treatment at a fertility clinic in Alabama through IVF. All three couples became pregnant and ended up giving birth to healthy babies. But if you're familiar with anything associated with IVF, when you harvest eggs and sperm and you create embryos in Petri dishes in labs to later implant in the mother of these couples, you actually create a whole lot more embryos than you need for the procedure. And there's a million different reasons for that scientifically, uh, obviously a lot of ethical concerns associated with that. So we'll come back to the bioethics. We're putting a pin in that, but basically you create a whole lot of babies. You create a whole lot of embryos and you implant some of those embryos with the hope that like one or two of them might actually lead to a full term pregnancy. But sometimes you're talking about creating like dozens and dozens and dozens of embryos in the process of IVF, whether that's for infertility treatment, whether that's for people who want to have control over what type of baby they have. The Paris Hilton story comes to mind. On some of this in the last several months, a lot of people have been drawing attention to Paris Hilton's uh, story of IVF, how she specifically wanted one gender of a baby and wanted to basically throw away all of the embryos that weren't the gender that she wanted to have. Very complicated stuff. But in the process of IVF, you create a whole lot more embryos than you actually end up using in the transfer process way more often than not. So basically, you have all of these embryos who genetically, scientifically, biologically are considered genetically unique human beings. That is a person who has never existed before. Their unique DNA has never existed before. They never will exist again. And should that legally also be considered a person? The state of Alabama says yes. So all these extra embryos get created for these three couples undergoing IVF. And again, like I said, according to Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, this is a very standard procedure in IVF. You create way more embryos than you actually need. Typically what happens with those embryos is they are frozen and preserved in the fertility clinic in a big freezer so that if you underwent IVF before, you can choose to use those embryos that you haven't used sometime in the future to have children again later on. And the presumption is that couples can come back at a later time and do another IVF cycle using the embryos you've already created so that you don't again have to go through the hormone treatments and surgeries. Why is that interesting and important to note? In order to harvest enough eggs to create the embryos, it is a grueling process on women. It tends to take about 10 to 15 days of constant injections of hormones into your body so that you can stimulate follicle production and end up harvesting all of these eggs to make the embryos in the first place. So it's really painful. It's incredibly expensive. It can cost between ten and $30,000 to just do a single round of IVF. 
And so they're trying to say, if you want to keep doing this in the future, you shouldn't continue injecting yourself and paying all of this money. Let's just make all the embryos now and we'll keep them in a freezer. We'll keep your babies in a freezer so that you can come back and reuse them another time. In this particular case in Alabama, what happens next is what gave rise to the case with this controversial ruling. The plaintiff couples, these three couples, frozen embryos, had been preserved at the fertility clinic in the freezer. They have a bunch of frozen embryos, all three of these couples, in the freezer inside of a hospital in Alabama. In December of 2020, so three and a half years ago, a patient of the hospital, totally unrelated to these three couples, entered the fertility clinic's cryopreservation unit, the freezer, and opened up one of the tanks in which all of the frozen embryos are stored. So pause, let's speak that in ordinary person speak, not scientific hospital speak. Somebody else at the hospital who had nothing to do with IVF or these three families walked into the freezer and opened up one of the preservation chambers without allowance to do this, without clearance to do this, just so happened to do it. The embryos are all stored at sub-freezing temperatures. And so when the patient reached into this preservation unit and tried to pull some of the embryos out, preserved in the Petri dishes and everything, because it's sub-freezing temperatures, he burned himself. If you've ever touched like dry ice and you burn yourself, that's really, really painful. And the person who opened up this freezer dropped the embryos on the ground and destroyed them, completely destroyed them. So they cannot be used in the future. And this is a child, essentially, that could have been implanted into a mother's womb later on in life that they were intending to use later on in life. And now they don't have the opportunity to because a random person basically just walked in, burns themselves in this sub-freezing temperature situation and drops the embryos on the ground, destroying them for future use. So the legal question at hand is, were those people, if so, was the wrongful destruction of those embryos considered murder, considered the wrongful death of a child, of a minor, and can the parents who are very upset about this and wanted to use those embryos in the future sue the fertility clinic and or the person that destroyed the embryos for wrongful death of a minor, for the wrongful death of their children and seek punitive damages? That's it. That was the question at large. Johns Hopkins goes on to say the plaintiff couples brought lawsuits against the fertility clinic and the hospital, both. One of the lawsuits was for negligence, but that wasn't a part of this very controversial ruling. The other lawsuit that is the subject of this case was against the hospital and the clinic for the wrongful death of a minor act, which is an existing Alabama state statute. When they went to this case at trial, the case ended up getting dismissed because a judge at trial said embryos are not people or children, legally speaking. The couples ended up ap appealing this and it went all the way to the state Supreme Court, the highest court in the state. The Supreme Court disagreed and basically said that the wrongful death of a minor act, which has existed since 1872 in Alabama, does apply to this situation because even embryos are people. If we biologically and genetically believe that your status of personhood does not determine whether or not you are a person, whether you are a fetus, whether you are an infant, whether you are a toddler, a teenager, an adolescent, an adult, an elderly person, or even an embryo, your stage of development shouldn't determine your legal personhood, whether or not we consider you to be a human being. So the state Supreme Court ends up agreeing with the couples and says this does violate the existing wrongful death of a minor act in Alabama and actually said this in their ruling to all unborn children without limitation does the wrongful death of a minor act apply. And that includes unborn children who are not located in utero at the time they are killed, i.e. they exist in a freezer, they exist in a Petri dish, etc., so, in fact, the Alabama Supreme Court determined that in vitro embryos are declared people. So they are children and the couples can therefore proceed with their lawsuit. They are seeking punitive damages for what they say is the wrongful death of their children. That's it. That was the legal question asked and answered in this Alabama Supreme Court case, basically saying to these three families, we hear you. We agree with you. These were children that you were hoping to implant, to be pregnant with in the future. Destroying them was, in fact, killing your children, and you can proceed with your lawsuit. 
Instead of just acknowledging that story, which is harrowing and tragic, and I can't believe how difficult this whole process has been for these families who want more than anything to be parents, everybody has just freaked out over the last several days since February 16th, saying that Alabama's making IVF illegal. No, they're not. That somehow this is going to be a banned practice in the state of Alabama. No, it isn't. And that anybody who participates in IVF is going to prison. And that's a horrible reality. And that's not pro-life or pro-family. Literally nobody has said that, but okay. So Johns Hopkins talks about this in this podcast, talking about the immediate consequences of this decision. They say within the first week after the ruling, two of the eight fertility clinics in Alabama paused their IVF treatments completely because they're afraid of getting sued. One of them is a very large clinic, as I already mentioned, at the University of Alabama at Birmingham Health System. The clinics say that they did so out of concern for the civil and potential criminal liability that their physicians and patients might face. This pause in IVF treatments also means that the patients who were scheduled to undergo the transfer of embryos into their uterus have now had those procedures canceled for the time being. Intense. A lot going on and very, very difficultly a complicated situation that a lot of people don't really know what to make of and involves a whole lot of emotion and a whole lot of passion involved in the process, obviously. But it's interesting and very telling to me how politicians and the media alike are trying to portray this story as they're coming for your children, they're coming for you, because in reality, it's a lot more nuanced than that, and no one has suggested making IVF illegal. Whether or not we should suggest that is a different question, but at least at this point in time, that's not the conversation that's been happening, at least on the anti-IVF side of the equation. All of the diehard pro-IVF people are trying to get you to believe that there's all these people trying to destroy IVF and make it illegal, but that's not really what I'm seeing, at least boots on the ground. It is what I'm seeing in the media. Axios put together a whole synopsis of everything you need to know about IVF after the Alabama ruling, that there's all these liability risks and flurry of legal questions happening in America today. Interestingly, almost everyone in the media is trying to tie IVF to abortion by trying to say this is all under the umbrella of women's rights and fertility treatments, which I find fascinating. Axios wrote, the big picture of this confusion is that the ruling throws into flux the IVF process for many families in the state who are hoping or are in the process of using the treatment to have children and launches concerns in a post-row landscape as if IVF had anything to do with the overturning of Roe v. Wade in the Dobbs v. Jackson decision or has anything to do with any state's legal statutes regarding their regulation of abortion, including the state of Alabama, by the way. Just for the record, in case you guys didn't already know this, about 2.3 percent of all babies born in the U.S. every year are conceived using some sort of assisted reproductive technology or ART. Um, ART is the umbrella term of which the vast, vast majority of assistive reproductive technology procedures are IVF. That is the main method of all these fertility treatments in which eggs and embryos are handled outside of the human body. We talked about how the procedure works and all of that, but I think this is really fascinating how they're trying to paint this. They're saying some providers in Alabama have paused offering IVF over the concerns of liability risks. And what they're really specifically trying to tie this to is Roe v. Wade, ironically. And that's what I've seen every major politician try to talk about, including self-described pro-life and conservative and Christian politicians, which is a whole can of worms I have a very hard time connecting in my brain because the moment you start tying everything else to the horrors of the abortion industry, the more we're cheapening the value of how completely unethical and straight up evil the abortion industry actually has become in the United States of America today. I think they're very fundamentally different questions, but involve a lot of the same moral basis for whether or not we should approach the just because we can, should we, questions in America today. Donald Trump even weighed in on this during his last major uh, rally, and a lot of people are really confused why he has the particular stance that he does, but I'm dying to get your guys' opinion chat, so check this out. 
We want to make it easier for mothers and fathers to have babies, not harder. You know that. That includes, and you saw this, it was a big deal over the last few days. And today I'm calling on the Alabama legislature to act quickly to find an immediate solution to preserve the availability of IVF in Alabama. And I'm sure. So even Donald Trump starts insinuating that IVF is now somehow illegal or unavailable in Alabama. It's not. It's these hospitals that are choosing not to provide IVF, not the Alabama state government. But he's like packaging this as sounding like this really pro-life, pro-family perspective to take. They're going to do that. The Republican Party should always be on the side of the miracle of life. So now calling for the entire Republican Party to support the very controversial practice and procedure of IVF. And the side of mothers and fathers and beautiful little babies. He wasn't the only one who decided to weigh in. The Auburn head basketball coach also had a lot to say during a recent press conference. I am a pro-life and pro-family and pro-child and I am a conservative Alabamian and I'd like to use my platform to call on all three branches of the of our state government and uh, and encourage them to make Alabama the most pro-family pro-child state in the nation removing the obstacles that are now facing these couples that are going through the IVF process. Um, government is supposed to help us hmm. and our families. Government is supposed to help us have families. All bars aside, whatever means necessary, Bruce Pearl says governments are supposed to make it easier for us to have families, not more difficult for us to have families. Creating this sense of family obligation and if you care about the family unit you must inherently support IVF which again I think is a whole lot more nuanced than that not prevent my son and his wife from having their first child or or or, or my grandchild so this is just fascinating to me because you're hearing that side of the perspective we have to protect IVF because it's inherently pro-life and pro-family to do that from people like the Auburn head basketball coach and even former President Donald Trump, who is considered by many to be the most pro-life president of all time. I mean, arguably, the appointments that he made to the Supreme Court of the United States are directly responsible for the overturning of Roe v. Wade in the Dobbs decision. But you're hearing basically the exact same language on the pro-abortion side of things, here is our Department of Health and Human Services, a very complicated individual of whom I am not a fan, unequivocally, essentially saying the same thing on national news. Since this decision in Alabama, some Republicans have tried to distance themselves from it, but as just noted, that could just be politics. It's an election year. We'll see what happens were they to take power. In the interim, though, in Alabama, where this is in effect, are there executive orders the White House the administration are exploring? What sort of granular things can you and your team do to help? Yeah, we will talk to families today, talk to physicians, uh, see if there's something we can do at the federal level. But the reality is, until we restore the rights that we had under Roe, my daughters, my three daughters, will continue to have fewer rights than my wife has. So you're hearing simultaneously the pro-life community, the self-prescribed pro-life community, saying it's price precisely because we don't want abortion that we need to preserve IVF. And then you're also hearing the pro-abortion side of things say it's because we need abortion because abortion and IVF are inherently linked that we need to preserve IVF. So no matter how you feel about the practice, no matter what your personal opinion is on either abortion or IVF, I think it's really fascinating and eye-opening that both communities are trying to latch on to this to make this their hill to die on for American politics. And it's, uh, it's a chilling thought that we go back to those days when it was illegal to do things that are good for your health. Good for your health. Interesting. Where it is good for your family to be able to plan out in vitro fertilization. It is a, a real fear to believe that you might face prosecution simply for trying to have a family.
like I said, everybody's trying to plant this idea in your mind that you're going to go to prison. You're going to face prosecution. Doctors are going to be arrested because they're participating in IVF. Literally, no one has said that. That is not at all part of this conversation. We just went through all of the nuance of this controversial case in Alabama, and that was never a legal question in front of us. But interesting how basically everybody's trying to twist it into that. And it reminds me a whole lot of when Roe v. Wade was overturned with the Dobbs v. Jackson decision, uh, because everybody was saying the same thing about women seeking treatment for miscarriages and DNCs after they've had a natural miscarriage, that all these women were going to be prosecuted and thrown in prison. Where is that happening? Because it's objectively not happening in the United States of America, but they're trying to get you to buy into it. So again, I want to reiterate as we transition into the just because we can, should we ethical concerns of IVF and why a lot of people has have come out very staunchly against the practice. If this has been a part of your story, if you were conceived through IVF, if you've had children through IVF, my heart goes out to you. I'm so glad that you are here. I'm glad that you wanted a family. I love having more children in the world. That is 100% a beautiful thing that we need to be celebrating because regardless of the circumstances of your conception, you matter and you are a unique person who deserves the exact same dignity, love, and protection as any other person. That cannot be overstated enough. But the more I've started to dig into this, the more questions I have as somebody who studied biomedical sciences and was really interested in fertility when we were learning about this in school and from a religious and moral perspective that I think often doesn't get to be a part of the conversation. So this is where I want to open it up to your guys's point of view and your perspectives if you support IVF, if you don't, and why you may or may not feel that way. As you guys are starting to drop some of your thoughts into our live chat on whatever platform that you're watching, I want to provide some of the background for why certain groups of people or why certain individuals don't support IVF as a practice. And I think it's very telling and interesting that the Catholic Church throughout this entire 50 year practice of IVF being used in clinical medical settings has unequivocally 100 percent of the time said that IVF is an immoral practice that we shouldn't be participating in. The United States Conference of Catholic Bishops put out this really unique article that the Catholic view of reproductive technology in vitro fertilization should be based in this reality of begotten, not made, which we say every single week at Mass in the Nicene Creed about Christ, but absolutely is something that can be pertained to human beings uh, in each one of us as well. They say infertility is a growing problem in the United States. In true American fashion, there have been a corresponding growth in technologies to provide a solution for this. It's praiseworthy and legitimate and beautiful to find ways to overcome infertility because they word this so beautifully. Infertility causes great pain and anguish for very, very many married couples. Since children are a wonderful gift of marriage, it is a good thing to try to overcome the obstacles which prevent children from being conceived and born. And then they talk about all throughout scripture, various examples of women suffering from infertility and the sorrow that they felt from not being able to have a child could never be diminished even by a husband's love. We say this about Hannah in the Old Testament. We talk about Sarah, the wife of Abraham and the mother of Isaac. Uh, we talk about this with the mother um, Hannah being the mother of Samuel, Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, when she conceived John the Baptist in her old age, infertility is a very, very common story that's talked about throughout scripture in both the Old and New Testament as a source of sorrow and anguish for women throughout human history. But the Bible also tells us that there are limits to acceptable methods for how to conceive a child, right? Lots unmarried daughters got their father drunk so that they could have children by their own dad. And that was very, very, very bad in the grand scheme of things in scripture. So Despite infertility becoming a, a rising problem in society and the sorrow that it's causing, and we should be trying to overcome the obstacles of bringing new children into marriages, the Catholic Church has always taught that different techniques and therapies that are unnatural and not per God's design of conceiving children are not a moral practice that we should be engaging in. And in 1987, 
The Catholic Church instituted a document called the Donum Vitae, which addressed the morality of many different modern fertility procedures, not just IVF. It didn't judge the use, I think this is important, of technology to overcome infertility as wrong in and of itself. It concluded that some methods are moral, but others are immoral because they do violence to the dignity of the human person and the institution of marriage and one reproductive technology that the church says does this damage to the institution of marriage and to the human person is in vitro fertilization or IVF. A lot of people don't know. A lot of Christians don't know that this is generally a Christian teaching, uh, especially in the United States, which I think is really, really interesting. And the immorality can be really difficult to understand and accept because typically when people use IVF, there are absolutely exceptions, but typically men and women who are using IVF are usually married. They're trying to overcome a medical problem of infertility and they want a child more than anything in the entire world. So they're doing this out of the desire to follow the vocation of parenthood. But here is why the Catholic Church, this is an argument, whether or not you're Catholic or whether or not you are Christian, a lot of people are basing their moral questions about IVF off of. So this is interesting. Why they say this is immoral is because in vitro fertilization brings about new life in a petri dish. Children engendered through IVF are sometimes known as test tube babies. Several eggs are aspirated from a woman's ovary after she has taken unnatural fertility drugs, those injections that you have to put into your body very regularly for about two weeks that I already mentioned, which causes a number of eggs to mature at the same time. Semen is collected from the man, usually through masturbation. The egg and sperm are ultimately joined in a glass dish where conception take place and new life is allowed to develop for several days. In the simplest case, embryos are then immediately transferred to the mother's womb in the hope that one of them, of the many that are transferred, will survive to term. Obviously, IVF, they say, eliminates the marriage act of sex as the means of achieving pregnancy instead of helping it achieve this natural end. This new life is not engendered through an act of love between husband and wife, but by a laboratory procedure performed by doctors or technicians. Husbands and wives are merely the sources for the raw materials of eggs and sperm, which are later manipulated by a technician to cause the sperm to fertilize to the egg. Not infrequently, donor eggs or sperm are also used because there's not a lot of biological viability from a woman's egg or a man's sperm, so they use somebody else's biological building blocks, which means that the genetic father or mother of the child could be somebody outside of the marriage. It creates a really confusing situation for the child. And they also say, even if the egg and sperm come from husband and wife, there are serious moral problems that arise. Invariably, several embryos are brought into existence. People exist and are conceived all at the same time, but only those who show the greatest promise of growing to term are implanted into the womb. The others are either discarded, they get thrown away, or they are used for medical experiments, which actually happens all the time. And I highly encourage you to look more into this because embryonic tissue is in fact used for stem cell research all the the time. It is a very concerning practice if we are just creating people simply for the sake of them being used as medical experiments and no other cause of concern for the rest of their life or the meaning of their life. Obviously, I think we could all agree that if you are a child that was brought into the world that isn't considered genetically fit to be brought to term and you're just thrown away, that is a terrible offense against human life. Or if you are a child that is brought into existence and conceived for the purpose of being a medical experiment for your entire life, that is a terrible offense against human life. But I think a lot of people have a hard time drawing the line between the morality of this because we don't immediately associate an embryonic stage of development as human, right? If we watched a disabled child be euthanized because they are too difficult to take care of or an inconvenience to somebody based on the status of their disability, we would call that eugenics. And we would say that has no place in a moral or progressive or enlightened society. But we don't even know that it's happening or we certainly don't even bat an eye if we know that it's happening for embryonic stage disabled individuals. We would be horrified if we were watching a toddler have medical experiments done on them. In fact, we look back at the chapters of history from Nazi Germany and say, how did anybody allow this to happen? Because we consider that to be a child, but societally we haven't considered embryos to be a whole person or to be a unique person that's worthy of our protection. So we don't even bat an eye when somebody in their embryonic stage of development 
is being experimented on throughout the process of their life. Even in the process of conceiving a healthy child in IVF, invariably, there will be other people, other lives that are snuffed out in the process, that are discarded, that are literally thrown into dumpsters or preserved in a freezer in perpetuity forever or medically experimented on because they weren't considered the genetically fit version of who gets to be implanted. And I think that in and of itself is a very, very important conversation to be having because this genetic testing that is taking place has already been a very complicated, controversial issue that is now coming to light because of the Alabama Supreme Court decision. Jumping back to that Axios article really quick, they talk about this at the very end. They say that physicians worried about getting sued from IVF might be less likely to recommend genetic screening of embryos. So the way that they word this isn't sounding like eugenics, but it basically is. When you go through IVF, they genetically screen more than half the time the embryos that you have created, and they look for genetic markers of certain diseases, of certain disabilities, of all kinds of disfigurements that we would consider to be something difficult to deal with, an inconvenience, something that we don't want to raise a child with because it's unfair to them if they have Down syndrome or spina bifida or any other major genetic marker that's difficult for us to wrap our heads around. So more than half of the time, they genetically test these embryos before they implant them. And Axios is now saying that patients are going to be wary of doing these screenings in the future in fear of the consequences they may face if they have a genetically abnormal embryo that they choose not to proceed with. That sounds very scientific. It sounds very enlightened. It sounds very progressive. But really what they're saying there is doctors and patients undergoing IVF today are actively participating in eugenics when they see an embryo that has a negative genetic marker or a difficult genetic marker to deal with that they just don't want to use that embryo. In other words, they throw that baby away because they don't want to deal with it. And as we know, in more extreme situations and circumstances, look at Paris Hilton. Even if it's a different gender than you intended for your baby, you'll just throw the other gendered babies away in the trash or allow them to be experimented upon because that's not what you personally were looking for. So again, whether or not you're Catholic or you're Christian, I think it's interesting that since the 1980s, the Catholic Church has regularly, repeatedly talked about IVF as an immoral practice, even if it has some net benefits for society and is rooted in a good place of wanting to help couples overcome the devastating pain and difficulty of infertility, of wanting more families in the world and wanting to bring more children into the world, we can't ignore the negative consequences and the negative societal side effects that invariably accompany the practice 100% of the time. Interesting moral argument to start weighing out. My friend Anna Lulis, who's been on the stream many, many times and is also the spokesperson for the March for Life, also had a really interesting, more non-religious take on all of this that I'm dying to get your guys' opinion and thoughts on because I'd never really thought about it this way, but it kind of hit me like a ton of bricks in reading this. The question I want to ask you first, chat, is whether or not you guys believe that people, adults, parents, have an inherent right to have a child. I had never asked myself this question before. And frankly, it's a really interesting one because I don't think it's the type of human rights based question that we often ask ourselves in our modern society. Mostly human rights that we talk about are like the right to free speech or even people saying you have a right to health care or housing, which is a very controversial topic in and of itself. But do you think that people have a right, adults, parents, couples have a right to have a child under any circumstances, under any means of conception necessary to make that happen. Joe says no on our Instagram chat. That's really interesting. I know there's a bit of a lag, so I'll make sure you guys have a chance to to weigh in on all of this. For Real in Real Life says we are not entitled to children. They are not a right. They are a gift. Interesting. Kent says some people should not be parents. Paul says, no, we don't have a right to parents because in the modern day, some people really aren't good parents. 
It's an interesting question, right? Do I, as an adult, if I really want to be a parent, if I have this deep desire to be a parent, have an inherent right to have a child? Almost everybody is saying, no, 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 no. Travis says, of course, that's interesting. Damon says, I would say, no, it's up to God. Grayson says, kids are a gift from our creator. Emma says, it's a gift, not a right. Albert agrees, having children is a privilege, not a right. Hmm. Fascinating. Alex says, no, you do not have a right to a child. I had never asked myself this. And so my friend Anna Lewis talking about this very controversial Alabama court ruling and just the ethical concerns about IVF that have come up in the process, put together an Instagram post that she shared yesterday that kind of stopped me in my tracks and made me approach this issue from a totally different perspective than I had ever considered before. She said, we don't have a right to kids. And again, I'd never asked myself that question before. So immediately I had to keep swiping. Kids, she says, aren't commodities. With IVF, people are created in labs. All of the ideal embryos are used while the unwanted ones stay frozen for an inhumane amount of time or are discarded, thrown away, killed. If we believe that that is a genetically unique human being that has never existed before and will never exist again, we believe in the personhood of that human being. And if they're thrown away in the trash, they are in fact killed. Like that is wrongful death. It is not a compassionate solution, she says, to infertility. It's an act that cheapens people down to disposable products. In Alabama, the Supreme Court ruled that unimplanted embryos are human children without exception based on developmental stage, physical location, or any other ancillary characteristics. So in short, she argues, they defended the dignity of unborn children by acknowledging the scientific fact that a human child's life and value begin at conception. So what does this mean for IVF? It means that people are held responsible for mismanaging and killing human children in their embryonic state. Does pro-life equal pro-IVF? She says no, although Donald Trump and the Auburn head basketball coach would tell you that it does. Does pro-family equal pro-IVF? She says no, although some people would tell you that it does. Does anti-IVF mean that you think people who came from IVF are less valuable? No. And I've tried to reiterate that 800 times throughout this stream because you're not less valuable in any circumstance. You are just as valuable as anyone because your circumstances of conception do not determine the worth of your personhood. And I like how she says this. Every living human is valuable, which is why it's important to recognize the value and humanity of unwanted embryos too. Only 7% of all IVF lab created embryos will be born alive. That's something that I had absolutely no idea about in terms of the statistics. I went and fact, fact checked this and it is in fact true that only 7% of the people that we are creating in laboratories actually come to term and are born alive as babies. So everybody else who comes into living conception in a Petri dish, in a laboratory, as test tube babies, are either thrown away, they don't make it through the process of transferring the embryos from the Petri dish and the test tubes into a woman's womb, or they are experimented upon and then thrown away. 93% of the children that we're creating in labs end up in a dire circumstance like that. And the way that she words this kind of blew my mind. She says, undesirable embryos the ones that don't pass genetic test screening, are discarded routinely. Many babies won't survive the thaw and transfer, and the few that do implant may be selectively reduced slash aborted or have their siblings selected for disposal. If you've ever known someone or you personally have gone through IVF, it's actually quite a common story, far more common than you would think, that They implant or they transfer so many embryos all at the same time because the chances of each one of them taking is actually quite low. So they might transfer four or five embryos from the lab into your womb, into your uterus, with the assumption that maybe on the off chance one of them is going to implant. But it's actually a lot more common than you think that multiple babies end up implanting. So you might be pregnant with triplets or 
quadruplets or even quintuplets. And the immediate solution to all of that from these doctors is always to reduce selectively the number of babies in womb so that there's a greater chance of that pregnancy being carried to term. So basically, they'll look at the outcome potential of each child in the womb and say, well, this one has a genetic problem or this one isn't developing as fast as the other ones or this one might have a hole in their heart or whatever. So that's the one we should selectively reduce, a.k.a. abort, to give the other ones a better chance at life. I don't think anyone who would consider themselves to be pro-life would ever be okay with a situation like that. But when it's happening a few weeks before, when they're all sitting there in a Petri dish and we've done genetic screening on the genetic viability of these embryos, nobody bats an eye. And that's considered normal and, in fact, enlightened and scientific and progressive, which is really interesting. And then, of course, she reminds us many, many, many embryos will spend their entire lives in perpetuity in a freezer. She says zygotes are human. Embryos are human. Fetuses are human. Infants are human. Toddlers are human. Teenagers are human. Adults are human. A stage in human development doesn't make someone less human. So if you call yourself pro-life, that means that you believe life is valuable from the moment of conception which we all like to say in the pro-life community when it's happening naturally through natural sexual conception and a child stage of development or location doesn't change that fact. Anna argues that's why you should be in favor of the Alabama State Supreme Court decision. She says pointing out that it's unethical to create humans in labs and that all children are valuable regardless of how developed they are should not be a controversial statement that kids aren't products. She thinks IVF isn't the solution to infertility. She obviously has to tack in there quite enlightenedly that birth control hurts women and abortion isn't health care. Well said. Women deserve to know they've been lied to for decades about their health. And the propaganda that they've been fed was intended to control their bodies so that powerful people can dictate who can and who should reproduce, a.k.a., engaging in eugenics and then experimenting on the less than desirable embryos that we don't pick to be born into this world. It has absolutely nothing to do with freedom, empowerment, or health care, she argues. I mean, mind-blowing. And honestly, questions that I've never asked myself, despite being very well-rooted in my faith, very active in the pro-life movement, Very, very outspoken about biomedical sciences because this is the stuff that I studied in college and I'm very personally fascinated by. These are questions that I think we should be asking. And if our society is serious about equal rights, if we're serious about living in a post-abortion America because we value the inherent dignity of human life, How that life comes about, I think, is a valid question for us to be considering. Just because we have the technology to do this, should we? Just because it's possible, does that mean that it's ethical? And it made me think of a whole host of other reproductive technologies that have now come into the fold in our hyper-technological advanced medical society. Just a few months ago on the live stream, we talked about a startup company in San Francisco that quite literally is creating embryos completely from stem cells, not involving a woman's egg or a man's sperm cell at all in the process. They are harvesting stem cells probably from embryonic tissue because that's where they're coming from and selectively differentiating these cells into an egg so that then they can create a human being without any involvement from a woman's egg cell naturally whatsoever. Uh, Red flags everywhere in the bioethicist in me, but is technology like that coming into development and something that we're cheering on and applauding and pushing resources towards Because we've normalized stuff like IVF, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a really valid historical and ethical question for us to be asking. So knowing all of this, I'm curious to know what you guys think about all of it. Bishop says, for example, new tech might soon give us the technology to change gender deliberately. But does that make it okay? Valid questions that we should be asking as spinoffs to all of this. 
Okay, I'm going to start scrolling back to see what you guys think. Gigi makes a really good point. There is kind of a differentiation in the IVF debate between what many people call unethical and ethical IVF. In ethical practices of in vitro fertilization, only one embryo gets implanted at a time. Uh, And so Gigi says most ethical doctors will only implant one at a time. The situations you are portraying are not typical. I would actually argue the opposite is true. The typical is that most people implant multiple embryos. It's a lot more rare if you look this up uh, to implant one baby at a time, one embryo at a time. But it does, in fact, happen. Uh, She says, if anything, laws should be passed to protect the embryos. They should never be discarded or tested on. Super interesting potential next step to take this conversation rather than banning the practice outright. We could create laws in America. This is all hypothetical. Protecting the personhood and the dignity of the embryo itself. That's really, really interesting to think about. Uh, Vote Better says, I've always said from the beginning, I'm pro-life and anti-IVF. It's worse because we are playing the role of God in creating these babies in labs while killing the ones that aren't considered good enough for society. Emma says IVF should only be available to parents who are good people and have been having huge problems with fertility. The practice needs to be treated carefully and with surmise care. It is a last result. Hmm, That's interesting. Thanks, Emma. Smash says embryos are so wrong. The idea that my wife would be bearing somebody else's child makes it so sick. Well, that's not always true. Sometimes it is the genetic makeup of both a husband and wife, but there are situations with donors for sure. And it says not to mention all of the children lost along the way just to grow these kids in laboratories. Joe says once a person is born, they have an inherent right to life. Not having the right to create a child outside of the marital act means we are not owed a child by God. I think that goes back to the question I was asking earlier. If you think we have a right to a baby, if we have a right to have a child. Fascinating. Um, little strummer girl. I want to make sure I didn't miss one of your earlier ones. Says, I completely agree with snowflake adoption. I don't know if you guys have heard about this. She says it's saving an embryo the same as normal adoption saves a born child. I actually know somebody who engaged in embryonic adoption. I didn't even know this was a thing, but so cool. And talk about unsung heroes in society. You actually can um, apply to adopt embryos that have been frozen in freezers for decades and decades and decades and volunteer to have them be your child and implanted into you, even if you didn't create the embryos in the first place. So when people people undergo IVF and they create dozens of embryos for babies that probably will never be born and they're there for decades in freezers and nobody's ever going to use them you can actually sign up to adopt those babies and try to bring them to term and give birth to them which is really cool a lot of people call this snowflake adoption but is a growing practice in the pro-life community and something that I've personally seen people go through and is a very very noble way to try to bring some goodness and morality and truth back into this practice I think it's fascinating. Maddie wanted to know my opinions on embryo adoption. Totally in favor of that. Those people are just sitting in a freezer and they deserve a chance uh, at growth and life the same way that we all do. Cowgirl says, if we as people, humans, choose to use IVF or other means, it is, is it still God that is breathing life into that child? Would he still not be the one giving the gift of life? Oh, girl. That is a deep question and one that I'm going to think about for the rest of the day, honestly. Of course, I believe that regardless of your circumstances of conception, God is, through the Holy Spirit, breathing life into each one of us. He is the purveyor and giver of life. And your circumstances of conception don't determine that. But I think most people's ethical concerns with why IVF is so controversial is because we're creating lives with maybe even the backup unintended consequence intention of destroying those lives for the proliferation of just one. But, oh my gosh, that's a really good question. I'm going to be thinking about that for a very, very long time. Ooh, that's good. Alex says, IVF is a practice that has man playing God that never ends well. Nitty witty in a dystopian society, if they find an embryo that they deem genetically defective, they would discard that embryo. Well, I guess we live in a dystopian society because that's exactly what standard practice is for IVF today. And then you followed it up by saying eugenics is making a comeback. Hmm. That's fascinating. They're trying to build a society that is a cross between Brave New World and 1984 fascinating 
All right. I really want to know, do any of you guys really support IVF? If, if anybody really is like in support of this procedure and process, drop it in the chat because I really want to know. Build and Craft says, my sister carried a baby for two men. They had an egg donor. She carried a baby that wasn't her own, and it made me sad that that baby won't know its mom or its first home that was my sister's womb, and she was paid $40,000 for it. Wow. That's fascinating. Okay, if anybody is really, really pro IVF, I want to hear your arguments for it because I think it's fascinating. Spirit is with me, says, yes, I support IVF. Tell me why. Because I think a lot of people are wrestling with these questions right now, and I want to facilitate a good dialogue and a good, good conversation around all of it. Wild Stoic says, I'm 50-50. And Little Strummer Girl says, I'm 50-50 too. Interesting. Jason says, I support IVF. Emma says, definitely 50-50. The practice at least needs to be changed, more ethical. Little Strummer Girl, I hate how babies are killed, but as somebody who knows IVF babies and people who couldn't conceive alone, it can absolutely help them. Hmm. If you guys are just now tuning in and you don't know what IVF means, a lot of people are asking, it's in vitro fertilization. When you conceive a child in a laboratory and then you implant those babies into your womb to try to get pregnant that way, it's typically... Um, a solution to infertility that people have been using in developed countries. Quaco says, sure, if you have infertility and feel like God called you to be a parent, then you should be able to do it. Interesting. Nicole, I support IVF. However, I wasn't aware how many embryos are being destroyed. Are there ways to do so without destroying so many? I think a lot of people are trying to figure out the nuance in that question right now. Earlier, it was mentioned like ethical IVF where you only implant and create one embryo at a time versus creating a bunch of babies at a time. I didn't even realize how many embryos are being destroyed. I mean, 93% of embryos created in IVF do not make it to a live birth. Whether they're discarded prematurely, they don't survive transfer, they end up in a freezer forever. 93%. That's crazy. Brayden says, I know it's not how it is. IVF, but no freezing. So you do one at a time. I know it's a hard process, but I have issues with the freezing. That speaks to what a lot of these people are calling ethical IVF and definitely is something that people are trying to facilitate right now. Kel agrees, Ramsey, there is there are ways to do IVF in God's view and ethical as a solution and help for infertility. Hmm. Interesting. Bishop X-Men says, I think IVF should be used very selectively. Cheng says, too many babies die from this. Interesting. It's just not worth it. Huh. Boo says, we had two beautiful children through IVF. They are Christians and will have a positive influence on their peers and their descendants. Thank you for sharing your story. I really appreciate this. Spirit is with me says, I had a long journey myself and have two 12-year-old twins thanks to IVF and they are beautiful Christian girls. Thank you guys for sharing these stories. This is really eye-opening and enlightening. Joyful says everything can be distorted and it can be used for evil, but it can be used for good as well. I don't think I would do it, but I'm not opposed to parents using it. Hmm. Sarah says, why would you support an industry that even inadvertently ends up killing so many babies? Fascinating. That's in very interesting. Ambrosia says some clinics refuse to transfer a defective embryo due to the high miscarriage risk for the mother or surrogate. What then are you supposed to do with the embryo? They would end up either discarding it or experimenting on it, unfortunately, which is really, really, really sad. Wow, this is fascinating. Kel says it's not black and white. If you have cancer, do you not seek health and help help and health care the same way that you would for infertility? M. Jones on Rumble says, yes, I support IVF. I know people who are not able to get pregnant in the normal process. Hmm. John Best says, if we could get rid of the evil experimentation on unwanted embryos, then yes, I would support the industry. Amy says, I would give those extra embryos up for adoption. I pray I don't need to use it, but I feel like God is sending me in. If I feel like God is sending me in that direction of parenthood, then I definitely would do that. Gideon says, in this world where we are already so separated from our creator, I think the practice of IVF furthers the distance between his good design for our lives. However, I do believe that God can and will still do good through that which we have broken. Wow, that's beautifully stated and really interesting. So regardless of how you feel about it personally, I think it's at least worth us asking these questions about whether in vitro fertilization is an ethical practice that we should be participating in a society that claims to value human rights and equality and equal protection 
under law. It goes back to this bioethical question of just because you can, should you? And even if it's not necessarily the intention of the patients participating in this process, there's a lot of questions and concerns from people regarding genetic testing and eugenics, regarding the experimentation on people that we have created for the purposes of experimenting on them and just discarded embryos, unique people being thrown into dumpsters because they didn't make the cut to be selected for birth. I don't really know that there is a clean cut and dry answer for most people answering these questions and asking these questions. And so I, I'm not here to tell you like you 100% have to agree with the decisions that I'm making or the agreements that I'm coming up with in my mind, but I can share with you at least this week I have faced a lot of ethical questions about this that I personally just haven't asked myself in the past. And I'm starting to realize that if I'm serious about bioethics in fertilization procedures and technologies that are being developed in other circumstances, I at least need to be applying the same standard to this question too. If I really believe that all human beings are made in the image of God, that all human beings, regardless of their developmental state, are worthy of our protection and our dignity and equal rights, particularly the right to life, that has to extend to embryos too. And if a procedure and if an industry is intentionally keeping those children in freezers for decades and decades and decades and decades in perpetuity, if they're throwing them into dumpsters and garbage cans or intentionally destroying them because they didn't make the cut to be a good enough human being like the rest of us, or maybe even worse, if they're experimenting on them in the process through embryonic stem cell research, that's a problem that I have, and it makes me question the integrity of the industry at large. That is certainly not to say that anybody who has participated in IVF or anybody who was conceived through IVF is a bad person or somehow is intentionally trying to kill all of these people. Of course, that's not the case. That's not what I want you to hear when I say this. But I think it's a cool opportunity for us to all sit down together and say, you know, this is a complicated moral question of our time rather than avoiding it. Or just listening to the headlines and one-liners that I'm seeing from my preferred presidential candidate or the media or my college basketball coach uh, and things that I'm seeing all over Instagram and TikTok, maybe these moral questions are worth wrestling with. Maybe if we're serious about living in a progressive society, truly progressive, not what progressive has come to mean in 2024, if we want to live in an enlightened society, if we want to live in Western civilization based in human rights equally applied to all, these are questions we need to seek answers to and at least facilitate healthy dialogue and debate about because our avoidance of them has led to all kinds of ethical problems that have continued to change the nature of the world as we know it. And I highly encourage you guys to do more independent research into this topic. I'm sure we'll have some more debates and conversations about IVF in the future here on the stream. But most importantly, above all else, I just wanted you to get the right information about what the heck was going on in Alabama. So if you guys are just now tuning in at the end of the stream today, go back to the beginning, because contrary to everything that you probably have heard on social media from politicians and the mainstream media alike, no, Alabama has not made IVF illegal. No, there is not a bill somewhere to outlaw IVF as a practice in Alabama or anywhere else. We're simply asking the question of legal personhood and who is constituted as a legal person in Alabama state law. So if you know somebody who's like freaking out, breathing in a bag over this particular court case, make sure to send this stream to them so that they know what the heck is going on. And I invite you to continue contemplating these ethical questions in every aspect of this crazy postmodern culture that we live in every day. Before you guys go, I want to remind you that our sponsor of the stream today are our amazing friends over at Hallow. Speaking of reflecting on the big questions in life, prayer is a wonderful way to do that. And Hallow is the number one Christian prayer app in the United States. Just a few days ago was the number one app on the App Store. And they have over 5,000 unique prayers, meditations, fasting guides, podcasts, storytelling community, and more that I really, really want you guys to have the opportunity to go check out for yourselves. You can go to hallow.com slash Isabel, H-A-L-L-O-W slash I-S-A-B-E-L 
to get a three month free trial to all of their content. That is like an unheard of promotion, by the way. And I highly encourage you guys to go check it out. They have honestly changed my life and especially their Lent campaign that's going on right now leading up to Easter on March 31st called Pray 40 has been the most wonderful grounding way to recenter my life every day as I'm going to sleep. It's guided prayers and meditations from people like Mark Wahlberg, Jonathan Rumi, Father Mike Schmitz, uh, Jim Caviezel, and more. Towards the second half of Lent, they're going to have some really cool content featuring Jordan Peterson's wife, Tammy Peterson, about her journey and conversion to faith dealing with cancer uh, and some really serious health and medical issues. If you guys have ever seen their interviews about that, it is powerful stuff. And I think can help us reorient our priorities and our goals in this upside down, messed up, self-obsessed world to reorient, to keep our eyes fixed on heaven and on God. So go check it out. Hallow.com slash Isabel. You can get a three month free trial into all of their stuff. And before you guys go, do me a huge, huge favor and smash that follow or subscribe button if you guys haven't already. It is a great time to be alive. Maze Page, thank you for your donation in our super chat. Appreciate every single time you guys do that. Don't forget to pre-order my book. And if you become an annual Locals supporter, you can get a free signed copy of my new book, The End of the Alphabet, when it comes out on March 19th. I'm going to go record some Locals content for you guys related to faith that we are posting tonight in our Locals community for our supporters. So that's it for the stream today while we keep rolling on lots of other fun projects. I will catch you guys later. Love you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.